morning's scripture read before the lesson comes from Matthew chapter 13, or chapter 12, verses 31 through 37. I'll be reading from the King James Version. Chapter 12, verses 31 through 37, Matthew. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blaspheme shall be forgiven unto men, but the blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever, but whosoever speaks against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye be evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And the evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Have you ever spoken an angry word? Well, of course you have. You've never been mad a day in your life, have you? You always practice righteous indignation. Now, I think all of us have said some words from time to time that we regret. Isn't that true? Have you ever, have you ever said something that you tried to tell yourself that you didn't mean? He's saying... Well, I know I said it, but I, I didn't mean that. Well, what'd you say? Well, you said what you said. Can you really say something that you don't mean? Well, we'll see what the Lord has to say about that. True or false? Every honest person must be able to admit that there have been times that we have said things that were sinful, unsanctified unholy, unedifying, whatever. I think, I think we all understand that. And for those who desire to go to heaven, we have to admit that, don't we? We have to come to the conclusion that there have been times we've said some terrible things. We have to realize what we said is terrible by the scriptures and not make those same mistakes again. But we have to admit that we have said them. All of us have learned words and phrases and jokes and insinuations that we wish we could forget or is it just me I heard all kinds of stuff I wish I could forget maybe you haven't but I have and with the Lord's help we can forget those things we need to train our minds to be sanctified what does sanctified mean it means made holy or set apart and once our minds are sanctified by the scriptures your mouth can't help but follow we need to have sanctified speech. Surprise, it's holiday season, so there's no rhyme to the reason this month. Today we're going to talk about sanctified speech. That's our sermon title. Today we'll have seven C's, so instead of rattling them off in the beginning, we'll just start with number one and work our way down. Is that all right? That's all right. Number one, sanctified speech is a command. Did you know that? We are commanded to have our speech, that is our tongue, set apart. It has to be different. Now, we understand, I think, that as human beings, we don't have the right to disobey God. God tells us what to do. God is the standard setter. We're not the standard setter. God is. And when God sets a standard for what ought to come out of our mouths, then that's what needs to be. Doesn't that make sense? It does to me. We are simply to be obedient servants in everything. Now, I think we understand I need to be obedient to the gospel. That, and by that, we mean I need to repent and be baptized. Well, that's true. But do we need to be obedient to what the gospel teaches in regard to our speech? Indeed, we do. Consider Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Let no 
corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now that is addressed to the church, but it is to every single individual of the church. The church, we are the body of Christ, the members in particular, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. So we're comprised of individual members. Paul says, by inspiration, let no com corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that is building up, that it, that is, that speech, your tongue, may minister grace unto the hearers. If, for example, we were asked, we were to ask your friends, does such and such, by their use of words, do they edify you? What would they say? Well, now let's make it even more specific. Let's ask your spouse, when you hit your toe on the corner of the bed at 2 a.m., is his speech sanctified, holy, edifying? 2 a.m. after he's hit his toe on the corner of the bed. Well, we'll leave that alone. What about Colossians 4, 6? Those, that's part of the gospel, isn't it? Let's look and see what Colossians 4, 6 says. Colossians and Ephesians are often, as you know, called the twin epistles. There's a lot of similar content. Listen to how it's stated in Colossians 4 and verse 6. Let your speech, that is the words that come out of your mouth, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. For what purpose? That ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Therefore what? Sanctified speech is a command. The gospel teaches us, let no corrupt communication proceed out of whose mouth? Your mouth. Do we see that? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Are those commands? Those are direct statements. That is directed to us. So number one, in regard to sanctified speech, it is a command. It is a command for all people. The gospel is addressed to everyone. Now number two, sanctified speech certifies that we are of God. Let's look at what our scripture reading was just a few minutes ago in Matthew 12. Just, I guess, by means of expediency, let me explain what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was. Now, you go home and read this in your context and you see if I'm right or wrong. Look in Matthew 12 and verse 22. There's a demon-possessed person, okay? Jesus cast the devil, the demon, out of the man. Verse 23, the people see it and are amazed. And they recognize this is the power of the Messiah. But look at verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow, that's Jesus, doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Now, do you remember our scripture read? Matthew 12, 31 through 37. What is that in context of? Jesus says, in principle, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. So what is really what was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It was seeing a miracle done by God. That is, Jesus, in verse 28, he flat out says, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, that is, by the power of God, to see that and say, God didn't do that, the devil did that. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Since there are no miracles today, we cannot in the same manner as they could in the first century, for example, blaspheme the Spirit. Now, I understand what blasphemy means. Blasphemy means to speak against. Now, does that authorize you to speak against the Holy Spirit in any way? Don't do that. Don't do that. Some of us, I think, like using the OMGs and things like that. Uh, uh, that's wrong. That's sinful. Don't do that. That does not authorize us just because we cannot specifically blaspheme the Spirit as they could and did, that doesn't authorize us to speak against any member of the Godhead, Father, the Word, or the Holy Spirit. Now, some will say it's the rejection of the Word of God, to which I would say, can you repent of that? Can you reject the gospel today? You, you will have an invitation. There will be an invitation unless I fall dead, and even if I fall dead, somebody still extend an invitation. There will be an opportunity to obey the Lord's gospel. If you don't obey it today, can you obey it tonight? Yes, then that's not necessarily blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But here's what we're talking about. 
Sanctified speech certifies that we are of God. Now, look at this in Matthew 12 and verse 35. A good man. Do you see that? Out of the good treasure of the heart. The Bible heart is the mind. What goes into the mind comes out from where? It goes in here, it comes out here. Does it not? Indeed it does. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Doesn't that make sense? That's why we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Are we not? That's why we're to keep our hearts with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of the heart, what does he do? Bringeth forth evil things. Don't you see that? Now consider what Jesus says in John 8, 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Qualify that with John three thirty four. He whom God hath sent speaketh, God's words or the words of God. Now, would it not also be true? Oh, I know John 8, 47 says, He that heareth God's words, and that really means obey. But wouldn't it also be true that he that speaketh God's words is of God? That is, it certifies that we are of God because our speech reveals who we really are. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he? Find that. See if it's not Proverbs somewhere, but see, see if the Bible actually teaches that. Number two, sanctified speech certifies that we are of God. Now, number three, sanctified speech is commendable. That is, it's commendable, uplifting to God and man. It is always good and right to do what the Bible says is good and right in the way that God said to do it for the reasons that God said to do it. You understand that? In principle, that simply means do what the Bible says as the Bible says it. Is that wrong? It's indeed not. Now, it is good to speak good and positively to God. But it's also good and positive to speak good and positive to our fellow man. Did you know that? It's good to speak kindly one to another. Does the Bible teach that? I believe it does. We must realize the power of words. We must realize the power that is involved in our speech. Think with me to Proverbs 18 and verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Do you understand that? Death and life are in the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That is, you want to destroy somebody? Go ahead. You have the, do you realize you have the ability to do that? Do you want to build someone up? Then do it. Do you realize you have the ability to do that? When our speech is sanctified according as what the Bible says it should be, we'll build each other up. Death and life are in the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverb 18, 21. Number three, sanctified speech is commendable both to God and and to man. It's always right to speak good of God. As he says, speak good of him. But it's always right to speak good of man. As God says to speak of man. Now number four. Sanctified speech communicates clearly. You understand that? Sanctified speech communicates clearly. Now communication is a skill. S-K-I-L-L that we all need to develop. Communication goes two ways. Don't you know that? Someone, for example, has to speak. There has to be a speaker. Some, someone trying to communicate information, but then there has to be someone to receive that information. For example, what good would it really do for me to be standing in this building talking to the walls? There's no real communication there because there's no one to hear what's being said. Do we understand that? Now, in regard to that, for reasons I get unknown, some people just cannot give a straight answer. You ever met somebody like that? You can ask them a, a distinct question, but you will not get a distinct answer. Have you ever met anyone like that? Surely you have. Have you? 
Now understand, some of the most distinct questions that you can ask have a yes or a no answer. Now there are some things that you have to kind of make a complex question. That's, that doesn't mean hard. It means if this, then that, then the answer would be yes. Or if this and that, then the answer would be no. Do, do you understand? But when we ask a distinct question, does that not deserve a distinct answer? Well, sanctified speech communicates very clearly. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, believe it or not, has a lot to say about our speech, the tongue, whichever way you'd like to look at it. Let's look in Proverbs 12. We'll read a few verses in Proverbs as we continue on down. Let's look at Proverbs 12 and verse 17. In regard to sanctified speech, that is our holy language, and that doesn't mean a holy tone. You know, some people can get a preaching tone. You ever met anybody that way? Me either. Proverbs 12 and verse 17. It's not hot in here today, so you're not going to sleep. Let's see if we can finish up. Proverbs 12, 17. He that speaketh truth showeth or declares forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Do we see that? Now understand this. In regard to clear communication, sometimes people can communicate very clearly. But the problem is not with the one speaking. It's with the one hearing. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear. Sometimes we have preconceived notions in our minds and we don't hear what comes out the way it comes out. We've already made up our mind and reached a conclusion in our mind and we don't hear properly. Think in Proverbs 20 and verse 12. The seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord hath made even both of them. Now what does that mean? That means we need to see things for what it really is. See things for what they really are. We need to hear things as they really are. The Bible is objective truth. God loves every single one of us so much that he gave his only begotten son. But sometimes we don't hear the gospel. We don't hear the simple facts, commands, blessings and warnings of the gospel because we have blocked our ears to hear him. Now, yes, we need to have sanctified speech, but as a side note, we need to have sanctified hearing. We need to hear the truth as plain as it is. Number four, sanctified speech communicates clearly. Now, number five, sanctified speech condemns evil. Did you know that? Sanctified speech condemns evil and doesn't condone it. In Isaiah 5 and verse 20, there's a principle laid out. Woe unto them. That's a pronouncement of punishment. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That change or call darkness light and light darkness. And those who change or call bitter sweet and sweet bitter. Do you understand that? If God declares something to be evil... I cannot condone that. I have to condemn that. Why? Am I better than God? If God condemns something, who am I to condone it? So sanctified speech condemns that which is evil. It does not condone evil at all. I think all of us understand some things in regard to that. And first off, we have to understand there is an absolute standard of evil. And there is an absolute standard, and can we know what that standard is? Yeah. Let's look in Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17 and verse 15 here. Keeping in mind Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good, good evil. That exchange or change or put light for darkness and darkness for light. Do you see that? If a thing is good, it's good. God says it's good, it's right. God says it's evil, it's evil. Call a thing what it is. Is that wrong? Condemn what God condemns and condone what God condones. Don't mix them up. Do you see? Okay. Proverbs 17 and verse 15. Here's another principle for you. He that justifieth the wicked. Do you see that? 
That's condoning what's evil. And he that condemneth the just. That's a mixed up person, isn't it? We cannot be mixed up people. We have to recognize, for example, the difference between faith and opinion. If we mix up faith and opinion, we're in trouble. Big trouble. Somebody preached on legalism, I think. He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both, what are they? Are abomination. To whom? To Jehovah, the God of the Bible, Isaiah 42, 8. Sanctified speech condemns evil. We cannot condone evil. And in order to understand it correctly, we cannot be confused as to what is a matter of faith and what is a matter of opinion. We have to study the scriptures daily to see whether those things are so. Number five, sanctified speech condemns evil. If God speaks out against it, what do I need to do? Speak out against it. If God condones it, what do I need to do? Speak out for it. hope we understand number six. Sanctified speech is constructive and not critical. I know no one in here has ever met someone who's hypercritical. Never in your whole life. Sometimes that starts at home with mom and dad, doesn't it? Was your mom and dad hypercritical? No, nah, I'm crazy. I didn't think so. Now, while we must condemn evil, we must also commend the just and the good. That's why we have to have the scriptures to know the difference. Do we not? Indeed we do. Now, let's look at Proverbs here again. In Proverbs 16. I don't even have to turn the page if you're like mine. Sometimes we get so caught up in the negative we forget there's a lot of positive. It's easy to fall into that rut. Ask me how I know. I know. All of us can get into that rut. Can we not? That's why we have to see the positive things too. The Bible has to declare what is right, what is good, what is just. The Bible has to declare what is evil, what is sinful, what is wrong, what is bad. Proverbs 16 and verse 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Now, does that mean we have the right to call evil good or good evil? So there's times where evil's going on. You can't have pleasant words, right? But is it all the time? Is it everybody and everything? No. Remember the glass that's still sitting here? Is it half full or half empty? There is a time to condemn. And there is a time to construct. Wisdom knows the difference. Let's look in Proverbs 12. Simple sermon today. Proverbs 12 and verse 25. Sanctified speech is constructive when it's time to be constructive. Proverbs 12, 25. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. That is droop over. Makes your countenance fall. The countenance in the Bible is your face. You look sad. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word does what? Maketh it glad. There's a time to be constructive in order for us to have sanctified speech, we have to be constructive. You can't beat on everybody all the time because everybody's not always doing wrong. Not everybody's involved in evil. Number six, sanctified speech is constructive and not critical. And by the critical, I mean hypercritical or overly critical. There's, there's such a thing as constructive criticism, but that's another day. Now, number seven, sanctified speech confesses the whole truth. Now, did you hear what I said? Sanctified speech confesses the whole truth. Not just a part and a piece here and there. There's only one truth in the Bible. There's only one gospel that saves. Sanctified speech says the same thing that God says. You understand that's what the word confess means. When we talk about confessing Christ, that is saying the same thing. Saying the same thing as who? God the Father says... This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, 37 said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. That is saying the same thing as God. So when we speak of sanctified speech confesses the whole truth, that means we say exactly what God says. When God has spoken on a subject, 
my, my, what comes out of my mouth and what my attitude is on that subject is the same thing that God says about it. If God says it's evil, what do I do? Condemn it. If God says it's good, what do I do? Condone it in the manner that God says for it to be condoned. Let's look in Proverbs 26. Then I'm going to give you a little test. It's pass fail. It's either a hundred or a zero. All right? Good. Sanctified speech confesses the whole truth. Let's look in Proverbs 26, beginning in verse 24. While our words are an accurate reflection of that which is on the inside, people will lie. Did you know that? People will have something in here the way they really feel, and they'll tell you something else. Now watch. That's why, but at given time and asking the right questions, you ask a distinct question, you'll get a distinct answer. You just got to know the right questions to ask. Proverbs 26, 24. He that hateth dissembleth, that is, disguises it maybe with his lips. You ever had a feeling about somebody? You ever had somebody look at you and say, man, I can tell that person right there does not like me. But then they say, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. It's so good to see you. He that hateth dissembleth, that is, disguises it with his lips, and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, oh, it's good to see you today. Believe him not. What does the Bible say? For there are seven abominations. Where? In his heart. Ask the right question, and you'll get the right answer. Sometimes we don't know what to ask. Read the Bible. It'll help. Look down. Verse 28. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. You think that the right thing to do is to tell a lie? What does the Bible say? A lying tongue hateth, loathes, despises, finds to be despicable, even make it love less. Fine. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth does what? Worketh ruin. Let's see. Let me give you a little test. Five questions. They're simple. Let's see if we'll confess the whole truth. And this isn't not the whole truth. This would be a good, good part. There is a God in heaven who created and sustains all things, and his name is Jehovah. Is that right? That's right. That's what the Bible says. What does confess mean? It means to speak the same thing. God. Jehovah has communicated with man in different ways. Yes, you can go outside and, and see nature, but specifically God has communicated to man through the Bible, his inspired word. Is that right? That's right. Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, is the only begotten Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of all men. Is that what the Bible teaches? All right, now I'm about to lose you. Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, built only one church. Oh, there we go. Founded upon and purchased with his own blood. That's what the Bible teaches. What does confess mean? It means to speak the same thing. The New Testament contains the pattern for the worship organization, membership, and so forth of the one true church. The New Testament. I didn't hear too many that time. The New Testament is our pattern for worship. If John 4, 23 and 24 is not a pattern, what is it? If John 4, 23 and 24 is not a pattern for worship, then what is it? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What is truth? John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, Word is truth. Does the New Testament contain God's pattern for salvation? Amen, it does. Today we've talked about sanctified speech. And though sometimes we may think we don't mean what we say, yeah, we do. When we lie, guess what? We mean to lie. When we say hateful, nasty things, guess what? It was in here first. You cannot squeeze out of something what's not in there. If so, give me the seed for your money tree. Come on.
I'll go plant it in the backyard. Man, I'll grow it, and y'all can come pick all of the $100 bills you want off of it. But you know what? There's no such thing. You don't go pick money off trees. You know why? There's no money tree. Is there? The things that come out of our mouth reflect who we really are. Can we camouflage them? Yes, we can. But God knows. We're not fooling him. When we lie, he knows we're lying. You may lie to me, and that's, that's on you. That's between you and the Lord. You can dupe me, but you won't dupe God. You can lie and say, yeah, I've obeyed the Lord's plan of salvation. Fine. You can dupe me. You won't dupe him. You can lie and say, oh, all this doesn't matter. Fine. But it does matter. Do we understand now why the confession of Christ is so important? Do we understand now why the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation? What confession? That Jesus is King. Jesus is Christ. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. We need to stop fooling ourselves into thinking that everything is okay when it isn't. There's one of two places every accountable person can be in the church or in the world. And once you've been added by the Lord to the church, you better be faithful. Not every member of the church is faithful. You know who's going to heaven? The faithful members of the church. The babies and everyone else uh, that cannot understand, they're safe. But for every person of the age of accountability and of a sound mind, you're either faithful in the church or you're in the world. Where are you? Your mouth will tell you where you are. Do you understand that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Jesus Christ, Matthew 16, 18. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking the bread and in prayers, Acts 2, 42. That's Bible. Where were they added in verse 41 of Acts 2? They were added to the church, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added daily to the church, added to the church daily, such as should be saved. What must I do to be saved? I'm going to confess the whole truth. I'm going to speak what God says. Hear the truth, Romans 10, 17. Believe the truth, Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin, Acts 17, 30. Confess Christ as Lord, Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, and brethren, Acts 14.22. It will be through much tribulation that we enter into the kingdom of God, heaven, the fourth heaven itself. Your speech is going to show you for what you are because you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What will you say? Say the same thing as God. Make it right now as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.